Hello, my name is Erin Clark. I'm a behaviour support coach at the Nolunga Education Office. This PD has been developed from a variety of different professional developments I've been running over the years, some in primary schools, some in high schools. This most recent one has been developed for some teachers within special options settings. What is challenging behaviour? So it is really important that we think about behaviour as a language. We need to try and determine what is the function of the behaviour and what is the child or young person trying to tell us. Again, what is challenging behaviour? We know that all behaviour is a form of communication and all behaviour has a purpose or function. We just need to try and find out what it is. So we need to be kind of detectives and try and do some investigations as to why our students might be behaving in a certain way. And the goal is not to eliminate the particular behaviour, but to understand the behaviour's purpose so that the student can replace it with a new pro-social behaviour that achieves the same purpose. There are four main functions of behaviour. They are, is the child trying to gain social attention? Are they trying to gain access to particular objects or activities? Sometimes they may be preferred objects or activities within the classroom. They might be trying to escape or avoid a particular task or unpleasant stimuli. This is quite often the case when students find work quite challenging. They might try and avoid this work or they might be trying to seek some form of sensory stimulation. Similar to functions, there are some main causes of behaviour. This is very similar to if we look at something like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So to start off with, we need to think about and investigate with the child, is there a biological cause to their behaviour? We need to eliminate if they might be hungry, if they're tired, if they're in pain, or if there's a sensory need that they're trying to seek or avoid. The next, if it's a social cause of the behaviour, so the task might be too boring for them or the task might be too tricky and they're really confused. There might be an environmental cause of the behaviour. There might be noise, there might be lighting, they might be trying to get a particular item. I know when I was teaching, I had a particular student in my class. Every time we get to a lesson, he would have his legs up on the table, his hood would be on, and he would always scrunch up the sheet of paper and throw it away. And I thought, oh, he doesn't like the work. It's too tricky. It's too hard. And this kept going on for a number of weeks. This was initially at the start of the year. In my small classroom, I had a tiny little heater slash air conditioner in the unit in the wall. Eventually, one day, he did articulate to me and he started screaming and yelling and he said, it's that stupid air conditioner. It's so loud. So once I realised I turned off that air conditioner, it wasn't actually the work that was too hard. It was the noise and continual hum of that air conditioner that was distracting him. Once that was turned off, hood came off, legs off the table, and he was in, able to engage in learning. So that's one example of an environmental cause. And communication. We know with many of our young people, they might have limited ways of communicating. They might have a language delay or a language disorder, and this can significantly limit the ways that they can communicate. This is a table of a variety of different challenging behaviours that are external. They can be categorised. So there's the aggressive types of external behaviours, the disruptive or what we might call antisocial behaviours, the stereotypical or self-stimulatory, we generally might see these with uh, young people with ASD. We have the destructive behaviours and the self-injurious type of behaviours. The next one, which lots of people don't tend to think about, is challenging behaviour can also be internalised behaviours. This presents as those students who sit in the class and are quite withdrawn, they're not likely to speak, they might have their hood on or they might have their head down. So we need to think about challenging behaviour as internalised as well.
So it's really important with behaviour that we're being proactive, not reactive. So we know that reactive approaches using punishment do not teach the student a skill to use in the future. An example of this is students who are out in play in, in the yard. If we just remove them from play because they're not being safe and we put them in the library for a day or so, they're not actually learning how to play and they're not learning skills. Quite often what happens is once they're off their safe play, they go back out in the yard and the issues happen again. So we need to be teaching our young people how to be successful in these environments. And we know that simply suppressing a behaviour by punishing a student is counterproductive. It may have the short term effect of reducing the behaviour, such as putting the child in the library at lunchtime, but it's not a successful long term approach to change and teaching the child the skills that they need to function within their environment. This is a nice little diagram that I like to, to look at and think about what if we are curious about behaviour. So we can't help children change their behaviour by making them feel bad for what they've done. Remember, most often with our children, they already feel bad about their behaviour. Many of our children and young people uh, have challenging behaviours, might have a trauma background and they might already feel really guilty and really bad about their behaviour. So it's really important that we show them that we care about them and we can help them find a sense of calm. Sometimes later when you feel regulated, you might choose a quiet moment to ask them with kindness in your voice and be curious about what happened. And this will help them change their behaviours and move on from the particular situation. Positive behaviour support and what is it within a classroom setting. The first step is we really need to identify the purpose of the behaviour. So that's what I was talking about earlier and we need to look at the main causes and functions of behaviour. We need to do a little bit of detective work and some data collection. We need to then, once we have identified what we might think is the purpose of the behaviour, we need to teach an appropriate alternative response that serves the same purpose as the challenging behaviour. So if the child is what some people might call trying to get attention. We might call that uh, connection seeking. If they're trying to do that in an inappropriate way by yelling out in the classroom, how can we get them to get that same level of attention without yelling out? It might be that they have a special car that they, they wave in the air to get the teacher's attention. The next step then is to consistently and explicit reinforce that positive behaviour so that the positive behaviour that they're displaying becomes more rewarding than the challenging behaviour. And this minimises the reinforcement for the challenging behaviour. Then the last step is to minimise the physiological, environmental and curricular factors that trigger the challenging behaviours. So this is looking at what might trigger the behaviours and trying to be proactive and reduce what we can within the environment. The next step is looking at a basic form of functional behaviour analysis within the classroom. I find this diagram a bit of an indication of what a young person might be going through, that they have a lot of internal thoughts and feelings that can come out in their body language and then it can be enacted in their behaviour. In this next slide, we'll work through the Department for Education's uh, wellbeing plan. And this is around uh, analysing what the function of the behaviour is. And it's a form of antecedent behaviour uh, analysis, or some people know it as an ABC chart, but this is a, a flow chart that's been developed by the department to, to help you analyse a student's behaviour. So the first step is identifying what the behaviour, when we're identifying the behaviour, we need to look at what's happening before the behaviour. So sometimes this can be known as a setting event or it might be known as an antecedent or quite commonly what we hear is a trigger. So we need to think about what is happening before the child displays that challenging behaviour. Is it that they're coming into the classroom really tired and grumpy? Or is it that the moment they walk into the classroom, someone says, oh, why are you here? We also need to explicitly state what happens before the behaviour and what may have set it off. So this might be the change in timetable, arrive late at school, argument with peer, couldn't get a drink 
and quite often with our young people, transitions to and from school or to another class can be a major trigger. The behaviour. So we need to describe what behaviour it is that the child is displaying. So it's important that we break it down and describe one behaviour at, at a time. We need to be explicit and use clear descriptive words. An example of this may be punched another student in the upper arm, kicked the classroom door twice at the bottom, then walked out of the classroom. This is really important when you analyse it so that you can see what's happening rather than just writing was disruptive. We need to know what that looks like. And then it might be important to include the frequency, how many times they might kick or hit, the intensity, so you might rate the severity of the behaviour on a scale of, say, maybe one to five, and then a duration. So it might be an estimate of how long you thought this happened. This is really important when you're analysing, you're trying to see if your interventions are working. Yes, the student might still be hitting and kicking, but they might be doing it less. Or the duration of the escalation, instead of being half an hour, has reduced to 15 minutes. after the behaviour. So this is looking at what happens after the child has displayed a challenging behaviour. How are others reacting? This is what adults or you might do in response to the behaviour. How are you responding? Are you trying to distract them? Are you telling them off? Are you trying to send them out of the room? And then it's also how the student reacts to you responding or peers responding. So they are arguing. Are they swearing? Are they ignoring you? Now we work out our hypothesis with our information. So after the information that we've gathered, we discover and we can make a guess. We don't know for certain why a student might be behaving a certain way, but we can take a guess and we can put some interventions in place and then we review. So some examples of some behaviour hypotheses or what some people might call a functional behaviour analysis. These are actual real examples of a variety of different students in a variety of different settings. So the first example, so it says the student will often have inappropriate discussions with other students in regard to particular body parts and use inappropriate sexualised language. So that's a description of the behaviour. And then we're talking about the, the function and how it's impacting them. So this impacts the student's ability to form and maintain healthy peer relationships. So this is, next bit is the hypothesis about why we think that they're behaving in this way. So it's suggested that he engages in this talk to gain attention from others as a way of bonding with others to signify, which signifies a limited understanding of social skills. So with this particular young person, the interventions would be aimed at teaching him more appropriate social skills to interact with his peers because he may be thinking, I'm going to be cool and I'm going to talk with this sexualised language and is missing the mark with his peers. The next one is a student that's presenting with what we might call antisocial behaviour as spitting. And this is due to students' limited understanding and awareness of social skills. So he wants to interact with peers and adults but is unsure how. This particular student had limited vocabulary and was particularly uh, non-verbal in certain situations. So he used spitting to evoke a response from someone as currently this was all he knew how to do. So in this particular environment, he was spitting because he wanted to get someone to come and play with him in the yard. He was always spitting during eating time, which really upset many peers. So the teachers needed to work with him around how he could ask somebody to play. Quite often he didn't have the vocabulary, so it was helping him with, with a variety of pictures and prompts to help him with guidance from an adult to ask somebody to play. And the last one is about a student who's in the state of constant hypervigilance, which we might see with many of our young people who have a trauma background. The hypervigilance can escalate frequently throughout the day and it's mainly around transition times. So his hypervigilance presents in the classroom as sensory seeking. So he's constantly squeezing others, he's rough playing, he's jumping on others, he's swinging around on chairs, he's rocking, he's rolling around on the floor and spinning. So this is a direct result of his attachment difficulties which has been identified through some other 
data analysis, and this is causing him a great deal of anxiety. So he's highly anxious and he's hypervigilant, so we need to teach him some strategies to cope within the classroom and implementing some sensory strategies so he can cope and he's not wriggling around as much. The next step is planning the interventions. So we need to look at what environmental changes we could possibly make to support the student's behaviour. So here are a couple of examples of things you can do within the environment to reduce triggers. And these are probably things that you might be doing already. A really simple example for everybody is a, a visual timetable at the front of the classroom. And it might be really important that this visual timetable is gone through explicitly at the start of the day. For some students, it might be that the visual timetable only goes up to recess time and that's explicitly explained to them because going beyond recess might be too anxiety provoking. You're looking at a variety of different delivery formats. So it might be visual, there might be things up on the board, there might be things digital that they can access through a computer or an iPad. There might be things print that they can access uh, that have been printed out for them or it might be things that are orally read to them. A really big one is reducing stimuli within the classroom. So this is might be turning off fluoro lights, not because, just because of the brightness of the light, but also there's a really, really low hum that fluoro lights make. And many young people on the autism spectrum can tune into this noise and it can be really distracting. It also might be noisy air conditioners or heaters. It could be the light that's coming through the windows. We need to look at seating placement or alternative seating options. Many, many classrooms now have a variety of different seats, but it's important that we are allowing students to get some movement. So it might be there's lots of uh, wobble stools or wiggle stools that might be really important that they can get that movement while they're still working. We might be incorporating brain breaks and movement breaks. This is also really important because we know many of us can't concentrate on a task for very long, so it's important that we are incorporating breaks for the brain and also breaks for the body. It also might incorporate some sensory integration, which can be targeted for different individual students or can be for the whole class. Replacement behaviour. So this is looking at what you would like the student to do instead of the behaviour. So this is about teaching them new skills. We need to teach the desired behaviour. This can be done in a variety of ways. It can be done through social stories. These can be created in a variety of different ways. It might be through video modelling or through backward or forward chaining. Other options might be to use a break card or identified signal to ask to take a break instead of walking out and explicitly demonstrating and explaining how to use it. Many teachers make the mistake of setting up interventions and expecting that the student knows how to use it without being explicitly taught. They may need to be explicitly taught on a daily basis for a couple of weeks just to see if they get it, then letting them try to do it independently and then reviewing to see if they can do that skill. Another really important thing is teaching emotional regulation skills. This is teaching students how to identify when they're getting angry and identifying a variety of different emotions. It might be teaching mindfulness or calming strategies, breathing techniques, and it might be teaching social skills or conflict resolution skills. There's a variety of different programs. Many schools use programs like What's the Buzz that might teach social skills. Whilst many schools are using What's the Buzz, which is great, sometimes What's the Buzz is pitched slightly higher for our young people. So it's important that you're breaking down that What's the Buzz program for them and it's explicit for them and they're learning a skill or it's reinforced on a daily basis rather than doing it once or twice a week. Rewarding. Rewarding is really important because we need to make the new behaviour more motivating for them to do. So we want to be rewarding the positive behaviours so they increase. And we're continuing to use our positive language rather than picking them up and saying no, no, don't, don't, stop, stop, etc. We need to think about what behaviour is it that we are rewarding, when are we doing this and how often. 
and then we need to consider the rewards. So it might be, for an example, if you can use your break card during the lesson, you can do blah. Hopefully many of you will be familiar with the escalation cycle. Many people are really aware of the steps leading up to an escalation, but what's really important is within the classroom that we're considering the de-escalation stage and the recovery. Many young people will escalate and very quickly we like to jump in and try and calm them down, which quite often can push them back up into the peak again. So it's important that we're thinking about our interventions after the behaviour as well as before the behaviour. This is a very small diagram with very, very tiny writing about looking at when we need to teach and implement our interventions. So we know at the start, prior to the behaviour, we need to teach and do our proactive work and do uh, the positive strategies when students are calm. We know there's no point in trying to teach them skills when they are escalated. When we're getting to that crisis point, this is when it's too late. This is when you need to enact your safety plan. And then we need to give them space and encourage. And then it's up to you to read the student and try and decide when is it time to jump in and speak to them and start to calm them down and begin to de-escalate and then start the recovery phase. Responding to behaviour. These are a couple of really basic tips and tricks when responding to challenging behaviour. Really important to be aware of your own body language. Sometimes we can be displaying negative body language and not be aware of it. It's also really important to own your feelings and emotions when you're teaching in a classroom. So if you're really tired and grumpy and you didn't have a good sleep, tell your kids, look, I'm not feeling too great today because I'm feeling grumpy, I didn't get a good sleep. And this is teaching them important skills that you're identifying how you're feeling and how you're presenting. Many, many young children will internalise how you're presenting and think that it's something that they've done wrong. I certainly remember when I was teaching within a special options setting, I was quite unwell. I was going home after lunch. I don't like the sound of loud noises. And so he thought it would be funny to blow up his lunch bag and pop it. Usually, I don't respond. This day when I wasn't feeling well, he popped it and I yelled. I don't think I've ever yelled in that classroom before. So I yelled out and said, you know, stop it, I don't like it, something along the lines of that. He went out to lunch, I went home. At the very, very, very end of the year, we were sitting down doing some literacy work and he said to me, Erin, do you remember that day when you went home? And I said, oh, look, not really. And he said, do you remember when I popped my lunch bag? I said, oh, yeah, I remember when I popped my lunch bag. And he said, did you have all that time off because of me popping the lunch bag and you were upset with me? And I said, no, sweetheart, no. I said, I was really, really unwell and sick and then I had to go to hospital. And I said, no, I said, I was just really grumpy and that day it upset me. You didn't do anything wrong. So we really need to think about how our behaviour can impact our students. Really important to think about our voice as well as our body language and not raising our voice, trying to lower or alter our tone and slow the speed of our voice. It's really important as well to avoid standing over or in front of a student. So try to position, position yourself beside them. This comes from our MAPA training that you may have done or the nonviolent crisis interventions. We like to minimise the use of words when a student may be beginning to escalate, it might be that we use a script. So we stick to a particular script when they're escalating and it might be around their safety. So we can say, I'm here to keep you safe. I'm here to keep you safe. You are okay. We need to be safe. Something along those lines. Or we might identify, if they haven't escalated too high, identify the emotion that they may be feeling. As adults and everybody, we need to be validated. Our emotions need to be validated. We can't control how somebody is feeling. It's their feeling, but it's about what they're doing with those particular feelings and emotions. So you might say, you know, I can see that you're really angry. How can I help you to calm down? And then you offer what might be called a, a forced choice. So you provide two options. Say, so would you like to do this to calm down or would you like to do that? Sometimes they'll pick one of the other. 
I used to often find they used to say, well, I don't want to do any of those. I want to do this. And I would say, okay, that's fine, as long as it was an appropriate strategy. Or we could use our wonder statements. So we can say, I wonder if you're feeling frustrated because this work is a bit tricky. Once we generally start to identify the feelings that they might be experiencing, they begin to break down and connect and might start to articulate how they're feeling. We need to remember to use positive and proactive language. So try to avoid using the word no or don't, which I understand is really, really tricky. But we try to think and reframe what you're saying to address the behaviour. So instead of continually saying to a child, no, you can't have that or no, you can't do that, think about saying, you know, let's use that train instead. Let's do this instead. Or redirect them to alternative activity or space without saying no, don't or stop. And it's a good idea to refer to safe and unsafe by saying, I need you to be safe. It doesn't particularly have a, a negative connotation and the student doesn't pick up that you you know, might be, say, telling them off. So we might say, Sam, I need you to be safe and put down the stick instead of put down the stick. Here are a couple of different examples of how not to respond. Avoid getting in the student's face. So we know that we don't like people getting up in our face. So if we're trying to help them or we're trying to talk to them, remembering a bit of distance. Don't discredit the student. Again, we can't control how we feel. It's what we do with those feelings. So don't discredit how they are feeling. Try not to nag them or preach, continually preach at them. Arguing and engaging in power struggles, this is really important. You are the adult in the classroom. We don't need to be having arguments with the children or engage in a power struggle. It's really important that we aren't tonguing or grabbing on the student or we're cornering a student. Cornering a student might be physically cornering or emotionally cornering. So it might be that when they are escalated, we are using our body language and we are kind of forcing them into a particular corner in the classroom, or it might be that we've presented them with a, an option that's too far ahead. So an example of it is, if you keep behaving like this, you're going to be sent home. You haven't tried any steps in between, so this can be cornering them as well. It's really important as an adult to not be overly defensive as well and try not to take things personally. It's really important as well that you don't continue following student behaviour with demands, continually demanding that they do something. I've included a short video clip. This is an example of responding to behaviour. This is from a TV show, Everybody Loves Raymond, that you might be familiar with. And it's quite funny. Uh, Ray and Deborah go to a parenting class and they learn how to try and pick up on their daughter's Ali's behaviour and Ray demonstrates his learnt skills and think he's pretty cool about it. The recovery stage is really important because we don't want to send the student back up into peak mode. So similarly, we don't continually nag the student because they're still coming down from their peak escalation and they may be really, really tired and really exhausted and so the chances of them escalating again may be really high. It's really important that we try to avoid blaming the student for behaving a certain way. We try not to force an apology too early. Schools are really, really big on apologies, but we need to think about what's the purpose of the apology? Is it simply because it's part of the school's behaviour code? Does the student understand what they've done wrong? Is it the teacher that's demanding an apology? So we need to think about purposeful and meaningful apologies. We really need to emphasise starting in you. So once the behaviour's happened, we're not rehashing the whole incident. We need to start anew and think, okay, Yes, things didn't go to plan and that's okay. Next time, here are some things that we can do better. We need to continually monitor the student for health and safety of all involved. So we continually to monitor, them, monitor the student for signs of re-escalation and monitor the environment and the others around them. 
continuing on with recovery, recovery, we need to continue to provide time and space. There is no set time for a student to calm down and recover. We can't just say, look, I'm setting the time for 10 minutes and then you're going to go back to the classroom and you're going to be ready. You might do that but say, I'm going to set the timer for 10 minutes and then we're going to see if you're ready to go back to the classroom and give them appropriate space to be able to calm down by themselves. We need to provide the opportunity for non-judgmental discussion about the incident. So again, that's saying, oh, I saw you got a little bit angry. You know, everybody gets angry, but it's really important to think about what we're doing with our anger. And it's not very safe to be hitting and kicking. So we think about it in a non-judgmental discussion rather than, I guess, propositioning the student and saying, you did the wrong thing, what are you going to do next time? During the recovery phase, it's really important that you're providing really easy, concrete tasks that the student can do that's not going to stress them out because they're already really tired and fatigued. And then you determine the appropriate time to debrief with the student and staff about the incident. Data collection is a really important phase of functional behaviour analysis. So it's important that we are collecting data on the student on a daily basis to identify patterns in the behaviour, potential triggers, as well as the functions of behaviour. Throughout the day, day you are teaching, you're really, really busy, and you might think that there is no trigger to the behaviour. But by simply collecting some data, it's helpful to analyse that, oh, okay, it might be a particular lesson that's setting the child off or they're not coping in this lesson or it might be a particular adult or another person that might be contributing to their behaviour. I've provided some examples of data collection. One is a simple what you might call a tick and flick chart. Up the top in the boxes, you put in there what behaviours are known to the child and what they might be demonstrating. So here's an example of hitting and kicking and binding, but also there's a, a box for positive engagement because it's important to, uh, I guess, collect data on, on when they're engaging well within the curriculum. So down the side, we've got the date, location and staff, and then the times of the day. You might want to edit this and do recess and lunch in there, or you might decide to write your literacy block. And then you simply just need to do a tally or tick what behaviour is occurring at what particular time. This next form is an ABC form for data collection. So similar to the one uh, with the flow chart that we worked through, but this is for recording larger incidents. So the chart before was a, a tick and flick for your more minor incidents, but then when a child perhaps has a larger escalation, you can record the antecedent, the behaviour and the consequences on this chart. So I think what's different about this one is down the left hand side we're gathering some extra information about the incident. So the date and the time, sometimes we might not know the exact time, we might just remember look it happened during maths and that's fine. The next is the activity. It's really important to identify what activity the student was doing when the behaviour occurred, what people were around in that space. Was it a particular adult or an SSO that was with them or was it a group of peers? What place was it occurring? Was it within the classroom? Was it an art room? Was it out in the yard? Then try to take a guess around the duration of the incident, how long the behaviour occurred for, the intensity of the behaviour, again, might be using a one to five scale if you think they were quite low on aggression during the incident or if they were quite high. Then we are looking at what you think the possible function of the behaviour was. Was it to get a particular item or attention or a sensory input or was it to get away from something? The next section is highlighting the Department for Education policies that come into play when we're supporting children and young people with challenging behaviours. There's a document called Protective Practices for Staff that you all should have received probably when you started your job and it would be around your school somewhere. It's also available on the Department for Education intranet 
and the training is online available through Plink. It also is linked to what we call nonviolent crisis intervention, NVCI. Now this is known as the Management of Actual or Potential Aggression, MAPA. Some of you may have done a form of this training recently or quite a long time ago. What's really important to remember is that you are documenting all incidents of behaviour, either anecdotally, so it can be uploaded into EDSAS, or using a data collection chart. Going into detail about protective practices, it is not appropriate to make physical contact, so this includes blocking with the child in order to ensure that they comply with directions. So we can't be standing in front of a door because a child is refusing to do work and they want to run away. So this can include holding children in your lap or between your legs to ensure attention at group time. So we're not talking about having a child, say, sitting on your lap and singing and joining in. And this is holding a child without their will in your lap or between your legs. So it's using your body as a force to stop the child. Continuing on with protective practices, it's important that you do not use practices that involve force applied to the head, neck, chest or genital area, restrictions to breathing, we're not punching or kicking, we're not holding by the ear or hair, and we're not confining a child in a locked room or limited space. I've had many questions about this before. If a child is escalating, it is not appropriate to lock them in the space. As well, in protective practices, it's looking at mechanical forms of restraint. So if a child is escalating or hitting others, it's not appropriate to, say, strap them in their wheelchair or we block them with furniture or use restrictive clothing so they can't move. Physical restraint. This is only to be used if all non-physical interventions have been exhausted or are impossible in the circumstances. And as the last resort, and if the child is attacking another child, young person or adult, or posing an immediate danger to themselves or others. Restraint is not to be used as a response to property destruction. It's better that the child is, you know, kicking around some furniture than kicking an adult or a peer. Physical restraint should not be used if the student is disrupting the education or care activity. They're refusing to comply. They're making verbal threats. They're trying to leave the educational setting or restraining them in a need to maintain good order. Safe practices. So it's important that you must be reasonable and it must be in proportion to the circumstances. So remembering that you are an adult and you are physically stronger in some circumstances than the child or young person. So every intervention that you use needs to be in proportion to the behaviour that the child is showing. So you use minimum force and least restrictive. So we need to take into account the age of the student, their stature, disability, gender of the child, as well as if they are an Aboriginal student or if they're from another culture. Physical contact must be, if we're needing to use it, discretionary, careful, consensual, respectful, age appropriate, gender appropriate and considerate of others who may be in the area. If you're using a form of restraint, think about how can I explain this after it's happened? So is this justified in this instance? Finally, I would like to leave you with a message. Remember, the only behaviour you can change and control is your own. <laughs>